Welcome back to the Cricket Today podcast on Wednesday, January 31. I'm still buzzing from an amazing week of cricket. I'm your host, Liam McCallion, also known as the Stats Guy. We've got Marcus fresh back from uh, some of the cyclones in Cairns, and he's uh, up and about for another week of cricket. Hey, how you going, Marcus? Cheers, I'm, I'm going good. Um, it's, I'm glad to be back where it's sort of a little bit colder because I couldn't stand the humidity. I was dripping and sweating in uh, oh. Cairns, but uh, <laughs> happy to be back. Yeah, awesome, awesome new. But I'm not confident any complaints about someone there going up to Cairns, I reckon. Uh, we're also here with Liam Mullally. How are you going, Liam? Yeah, good, thanks, Stats Guy. A little sad, though. We've got a bit of a quiet spot of cricket right now, so I'm just looking forward to Friday, so we've got some ODI action. Yeah, I think we're, we're going to go. A few of us are going to go to that match. I'm very excited uh, for some more cricket at the G. We always love that. Been uh, in Melbourne, based in Melbourne, so we're very excited for that one. Uh, today, we're, we're going to cover a whole lot of things. We've got some yeah, nahs from the summer tests, uh, something that we want to just quickly talk about. Then we get into an interview with Code Sports journalist uh, Dan Churney. We're going to discuss Shamar Joseph, of course, who we love discussing on Monday's podcast. Uh, and then a bit of, about the white ball matches coming up, a few of the young guns coming in for the uh, ODIs and then the T20s and things like that. So we're excited to talk about that. Dan Churney was a great uh, interview talking to him. Uh, so why don't we get right into it, lads? Uh, actually, we're also going to cover some of our favourite ODI moments as well, looking at ahead to the ODIs that Australia versus West, West Indies start this Friday. Uh, some yeah, nahs from the summer test. We'll yeah, quickly start with one here, Leo. Do you want to read it out for us? Yeah, so do the Aussies need to pick a specialist opener? Yeah, nah. Ooh, what do you reckon, Marcus? Um, I'm going to go nah just for now because I think – we need to let this experiment ride a little bit. Um, obviously, if Steve Smith is moving around the crease, um, obviously I wasn't on the, the previous shows because uh, I was away, but the way he was moving around the crease as an opener when the ball moves that much early on, mm. you can't be doing that um, if you want to open the batting. And that's what led to him being caught LBW in the first innings. But in the second innings, you saw he was a lot more still um, it, it, on the crease. He wasn't moving around and he, and he went and scored 90-odd not out. Um, obviously, he didn't go on to win us the game, but uh, it was a great innings nevertheless. Um, so if he just continues that, and, and it's all down to whether you want to ha- fit Cam Green into this side. Um, although I think that like he's still very young and he's got plenty of cricket ahead of him. I don't mind bringing in a specialist opener, but for now, I think you're just going to let the experiment ride. Yeah, no, I think you've actually explained that pretty well. I think yeah, now that they've picked Smith... It, like, like we talked about this sort of question a couple of weeks ago, I think a few of us were going, oh, a specialist opener, maybe even green or testing a few of the younger guys out. But I don't mind it. Smith obviously got 91 not out. It was really good. Marcus, great analysis there. He, he kept his head down a little bit more. It was a bit straighter, a bit more less Smith-like, less smudger-like where he, he needs to be in between, not the full smudge uh, where he goes a bit all over the shop, a bit too fidgety. Uh, just needs to bring it down a little bit like he did in that second innings and he could be a really good opener. I, I do still back Smith. I think that you can't really uh, bag Steve Smith at all through his, uh, at his whole career. So I think we still got to back him just because he's one of the greatest batsmen of all time. It'll just be interesting once we come up against uh, New Zealand in about a month's time when you sort of a, a better test team. I know we lost to the West Indies, but probably a better test team. It's be interesting if he can keep that up as open. But I'm going to say, nah, for now, do we need to pick a special? I feel like Leo's on the other side because he's been a big Cam Bancroft fan for, for a while. I have been, but I think I agree agree with you boys. Um, now that we've done it, we can't really abandon it yet. I think if we were playing India or England upcoming, then, you know, abandon it, get rid of it because they'll kill us in our top order. Um, yeah. But with New Zealand, look, if I still have my reserve, like my doubts about it because I think someone like Trent Bolt, Tim Sowley, those guys will be able to, exploit him in front of the stumps. Bolt's got a great in-swinger that Smith, you know, I can just see him getting plum trapped in front. Like, yeah, it's just one of those things where I, I didn't want to do it in the first place, but now we've done it. We have to stick with it and it's a bit annoying, but yeah. No, no, that's fair enough. I think that's maybe the Aussie selectors are probably thinking that in the back of their head as well. Just a random off-the-cuff one. I was I saw yesterday that Will Pukowski is still trying to get back in the test side. I know he's had a lot of uh, head knocks and we've talked to, talked that, a lot about that uh, across the show. If he gets ticked off and stuff, uh, I there's part a small part of me that goes, I really wanted to play because I think he's an absolute star. But I just don't know if he's ready. What do you, what do you guys think about that one? No, nah, not at all. Nah. Um, no, he shouldn't be allowed uh, near any squad, I don't think, at the moment. Not not of his ability, of course, but yeah. just off his pure health and safety. No way. He, he, can't, he can't play. Um, yeah. Because if, if he gets one head knock... 
And you can see he's lost all confidence a little bit in those when he's playing the short balls as well. So, True. Um, no, for me, no way. Yeah, no, I, actually, I didn't think about I forgot about that video I saw of him facing that short ball and just he didn't even see where the ball was. It was, I think, yeah, he has lost a bit of confidence. What do you reckon, Leo? Are you leaning towards the same or? Yeah, it's about his long term health, isn't it? So, probably just for the best for him. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's one of those ones where you got to re- reward the guys playing consistent shield cricket. Yep, yep. Yeah, that's what we've rewarded some guys playing consistent BBL cricket, obviously now in the ODI squads. It's just, yeah, that Sheffield Shield to test jump still hasn't really connected too well for the uh, Australian test side. And it'll just be interesting if they can, uh, yeah, connect that in the future. Uh, all right, like we've covered a bit of Yenar, a bit of Yenar there about this openers that everyone's sort of talking about, the batting order of Australia. I'm going to go now into an, another special segment with Daniel Cherney, code sports journalist. We're going to add a bit of professionalism onto this podcast, lads. Uh, we talked about, uh, me and Daniel Cherney, about all things West Indies cricket, obviously, Shamar Joseph, where the Aussies uh, broke down, wasn't too good with their batting, obviously, and looking ahead to some young guns for the ODIs and T20s at the end of this week as Australia uh, play the West Indies. So let's get right into it. All right, Cricket Today here with another special segment. Rather than the usual knucklehead, so we've brought in some, some professionalism, I like to say. I'm here again with Daniel Cherney, Cricket AFL, AFLW sports journalist with Code Sports, one of the best in the business, who's up and about after being actually being there in Brisbane for the crazy test match between Australia and the West Indies. How are you going, Dan? And really, thanks for coming on. No, pleasure to be here. Liam, good, uh, going well and good to be with you. Obviously, you're up there for the match, uh, Dan. We were very, very happy that the rain held off on Friday. In our podcast predictions, we were thinking the last two days were going to be a bit scratchy with the rain and cyclones predicted and things like that. So, very happy that the rain held off and must have been insane to be there. How did it feel to be there as the West Indies made history in Brisbane? No, it was a real privilege to be there, obviously. An, an incredible game. Um, you know, one of those things we just get a reminder of um, there's nothing like live sport and uh, it's the under- for the unpredictability of it, and um, you know, I don't think anyone would have expected that sort of result. Uh, certainly heading into the match, and then particularly when uh, we're heading to the series, and then given uh, the West Indies' position on day one when they were five for sixty odd, but uh, an incredible comeback through the test from the Windies, and even heading in, into the last day, and with Australia sort of going uh, going along pretty nicely at two for one hundred and thirty, and you thought, oh, you know, they should should be able to get home here, but. Uh, Shamar Joseph, just you know, what an extraordinary story! And um, you know, for, from uh, from nothing, from this guy from remote, uh, a remote guy in his village, to come through, have all the injuries that he had. Or the, sorry, the, the injury that he had, uh, you know, didn't you know, didn't look like he was going to be able to play at all on, on day four of the test, and then to to run through Australia like that with one of the, the great spells, really, of um, of modern times, or really of all time, uh, certainly for for a touring bowler in Australian Australian shores, that was that uh, was something special. Yeah, Dan, you quickly touched on it there, but we have to talk about the man of the moment, Shamar Joseph. I think he's my favourite cricketer in the world at the moment. Uh, you also mentioned that he, he's inj- playing but through that injury. was unbelievable. I just want to know, what did you make of Shamar Joseph's seven far? I think you touched on it briefly just then, but quickly a bit more in depth into that. And where does it rank for overseas players, figures in Australia? Because I thought it was up there with some of the very best. Oh, it has to be right up there. I mean, particularly in the circumstances, you know, given he's the second gamer, given the injury concern, given the challenges, uh, the quality of, of, of lineup he was batting you know, against, you know, a, a team featuring a guy like Steve Smith, who obviously did survive in the end, but, um, you know, an accomplished batting lineup with, with the likes of, uh, of, of Travis Head yeah. uh, and Mitch Marsh, you know, it wasn't what well, went mugs that he was getting. Um, I mean, he did run through the tail, of course, as well, but. Uh, no, it's got to be right up there. I mean, I, th- I heard um, my colleague Robert Craddock talking about this the other day, and he, he was sort of pointing to Kurtley Ambrose's famous seven for one spell yeah. at the Wacker in 1993, uh, about 30 years ago. And um, Richard Hadley took nine for against Australia at the Gabba in, in, in the mid 80s. I oh, looked there been a handful, but um, oh, this is this is top shelf. And uh, as I said, particularly given given the circumstances, given the um how on, on how little this guy had played at all um but you're you're right i mean you talk, talk about his his you know favorite cricketer he's sort of everyone's favorite cricketer yeah. instantly i mean how, how could you not like him he's got charisma uh, he's got a bit of cheek in him um just that raw pace but that skill as well you know it's not just um you know the subtle movement and uh you know just knowing where to, where to bowl um to have those smarts as i said you, you can have you can have the pace but to then be able to to put it all into action um, at a crunch time like that, just exceptional and well deserved as player of the match and of the series, uh, and and it's going to be fascinating to see what happens from from here for him because you know you think this is you know perhaps only just scratching the surface of a guy like this is talent. You know he hasn't had um, the build up that some other guys have had. Maybe that rawness is an advantage, 
Um, and, you know, I suppose he's in his physical peak at 24, but uh, extraordinary bowler. And, um, yeah, it's going to be, as I said, intriguing to see what, what, what comes next for Shamar Joseph. Yeah, I definitely share your excitement with uh, Shamar Joseph. It's going to be excited to see uh, what, what happens in the future with him. He's obviously signed in the PSL this week uh, in the Pakistani uh, Super League. So we're very excited to watch him uh, tear it up over there. Uh, they didn't pick him in, it's easy to say this in hindsight, but they didn't pick him in the ODI squads, the West Indies. Do you think the West Indies will struggle in the white ball matches coming up after not picking uh, Shamar Joseph then? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I suppose, look, it's such an afterthought, these, these three ODIs in particular. Um, yeah. Each one is are a bit more relevant heading into a T20 World Cup um, yeah. in June, you know, and Australia picked a much stronger side for those T20s than they have for the ODIs where they picked three or four, well, I think uh, it might be up to four or five uncapped guys. Lance Morris, who has been around the test squad before, but probably going to make his international debut. You've got Will Sutherland, Jake Fraser McGurk, uh, Xavier Bartlett as well. So yeah. there's a, a handful of guys who we haven't seen much of. And then a guy like Aaron Hardy, who's only had a, had a taste and even a match short, who's still relatively new to international cricket. So it's a very, very young, particularly bowling attack that we're going to we're going to see. In terms of the Windies, look, they're actually, they actually come in in not bad one-day form. I mean, they did miss the World Cup, which is obviously a huge blow to them, but they did beat England uh, in a series uh, right. late, late last year in the Caribbean. Uh, so they're actually not a bad. You know, if, if you're looking at where heading into this tour, you would have thought, oh, where would the West Indies maybe be a chance? You would have thought, well, maybe yeah. maybe in one of the in the white ball formats where, you know, there's, there's less... Um, I suppose the shorter, the shorter the match, I suppose the more of a lottery it is. In yep. terms of Joseph's non-selection, you're right, it did seem a bit baffling in, in hindsight. I mean, clearly this guy, you know, he played so little cricket and I suppose they didn't know what they had. Um, he, uh, it sounds like he's now got an injury. Well, you know, that injury has come up, so he's probably not going to go to the UAE where he had been due to go to play the Dubai, to play for the Dubai Capitals, which is uh, David Warner's club. So, look, I suppose uh, the, the, there's an element there where... Uh, you know, in the end, he probably wouldn't have played anyway. It would have been great for the for the series, for, for yeah. given he is so in vogue. I mean, it's hard to believe that he may have been the biggest draw card of all, especially in the absence of some of the, the big name Aussies. So there's no David Warner, clearly, who's retired from the format. Glenn Maxwell's been rested, uh, as two of the main quicks and, and Mitch Marsh. But um, no, look, I, look, Wendy's and some of the white ball guys, look, there'll be a fair few names there that we haven't seen much of either, especially given that they weren't at the World Cup. They turned over their squad significantly, say, from 2019. Um, when, they, when they were last in the 50 over World Cup. Um, so I'm interested to see how, how they fare. I, I think they're, they're not without a chance, especially against an, an inexperienced Australian side. I think Australia still yeah. go in as, uh, as, as probably you know, favourites, but without being absolutely overwhelming favourites. No, nah, excellent analysis there, Dan. I think you hit the nail on the head. In hindsight, obviously, it's easy to pick someone based on what they've done now. No one even knew what he was going to do. So I think in hindsight, it's easy to say, but they'll still put up a strong fight, with, as you mentioned, with a strong ODI squad. Uh, quickly on the next one, Dan, Steve Smith obviously finished with a strong 91, not out as opener. But uh, there's been a lot of questions, a few articles floating around on Twitter and uh, Code Sports as well. Does Australia need to change their test batting lineup at all, do you think? It's a good question. I mean, you look look into the series and, and the talking points were around, obviously, the remodeled top six and yep. two guys batting in new positions, that being Smith and Green. Uh, and Green has plenty of experience, number four, in first-class cricket, but but not in test the test level. And I suppose heading in, you know, given neither of them uh, set the world on fire uh, in, in the first test, the, the, those are probably the two guys most under the pump heading into the second test. Yep. As it so turned out on... Um, on, on day four, uh, they were Australia's two best batters, particularly Smith, clearly, with the 91 not out. But Green, you know, did get to 42. And, and those two, you know, they they had the game in, in reasonable control. Now, 42 is not, you know, clearly wasn't a match-winning performance. and, and uh, But it's, it's a start. And it's some... Yeah. Um, so, that, you know, the guy that's that's most struggling at the moment really is Manus Labuschagne. He, he's yeah. had a very poor series, averaging just a bit over six across... Uh, I mean, obviously, a, a few innings. But... Uh, uh, but it's it's not just this this series. It's been sort of a pretty um, pretty steady decline over more than twelve months now. Now that's from an incredible high, and he'd probably been a bit lucky. Um, when I say lucky, you know, not not since he's not deserving of his runs, but he'd been, you know, just had the rub of the green with drop did, yeah. and, and yeah. the, some umpires calls, those sorts of things that just you know things had gone his way. Um, so perhaps there's a bit of regression to the mean. You know, uh, his, his average has dropped from sixty point eight two to fifty point eight two. So, look, I think it's just the combination of factors. You know, Travis Head, the nature of a player like that, he's going to be a bit hit and miss. Uh, and, you know, no greater example than these couple of tests gone. A, a, a king match pair, winning, yeah. yeah. A match winning century and then a king pair. So, you know, it doesn't really get any any starker than that. Um, Mitch Marsh is an interesting one in the sense that, you know, obviously he's made a very strong return to the test side. Excellent in the Ashes. Really good series against Pakistan. Not so against the Windies. And 
I just do worry a bit whether he – having him at six, I think, is fine, but whether he can have Green at four and him at six, I'm just not quite sure that that it's quite a sturdy enough four, five, six, especially when Manus isn't making runs at uh, – at three, so well, Kawaj has been, you know, very consistent. And he's, um, but he's also the oldest of them. So yep. it's just not, it's not firing all cylinders. Look, they they've managed to overcome some of this inconsistency over the last twelve months to to achieve most of their major goals. And the bowling's got them out of a few holes or one or two performances here or there. You know, Head st- stood up, or Marsh has stood up, or Manus stood up in that um, in that Raymar test in, in Manchester back in uh, back in July. But um, you know, really, this this is not a batting unit which you think is going to get better um, in its current in- in- incarnation. Perhaps Green is the one who has the upside, but the rest are all, you know, minus is 29, the rest are all over 30, 30 or over. And uh, yep. it's not, t- you know, you tend to, you know, it tends to be downhill from there. Um, so they can't rely on Osmond for that much longer, you wouldn't have thought. Uh, ditto Smith. Um, so it's just getting a little, to an interesting phase. And, um, you know, these couple of tests in New Zealand are, are, are important. Um, I think the one thing that's probably been lost a little bit in the, in the broader debate around Australia's performance at the Gabba was the implications for the World Test Championship. Of course, yeah, yeah. They've got only the um, – because it's a two-test series, it sort of counts – each test counts more. So the way that WTC works is that each series, um, the value of each test is, is um, relative to how many tests there are. So – Weirdly enough, an Ashes test is actually worth less than, uh, considerably less, two and a half times less, yeah. say, than, than a West Indies test because it's only two tests, so it's divided, you know, it's 50-50 as opposed to 20%. Yeah. So that's a quite a big chunk of, of Australia's home points that they would have banked for and, and which Pat Cummins said ahead of this summer were, were non-negotiables on the back of also losing some some points for net run rate. That's really big for, for uh, over rate, um, over rate, yeah. Over eight um, infringements there in England. So they've got two tests in New Zealand, then five next summer against India and two against Sri Lanka. That they're not going to, you know, because because of some of the other results around the cricketing world, we saw the incredible India England test, South Africa winning um, against India in a test, and got New Zealand coming up against a week in South Africa coming up. A lot of teams are sort of beating each other, which probably means that there's there's a bit more room um, breathing space for Australia, but. We're not talking a hell of a lot of breathing space either by that token. And and they would have banked on beating the West Indies 2-0. They like, haven't done that. So as McDonald, the coach, said post, post-match, post they're really going to have to make one up um, and, and probably going to have, you know, very little margin for error either in New Zealand or in Sri Lanka. Yeah, wow, well, Dan, I didn't actually think about the insight uh, into the World Test Championship, obviously two and a half times. Uh, yeah, I didn't actually think about that. So that could be a critical. I know it's 18 months away sort of until the World Test Championship table is done, but that could, yeah, make some changes. That loss of the West Indies could cost us, but we'll have to wait and see. Also interesting, like you mentioned, a lot of players out of their prime in our batting line. It's just going to be interesting to see over the next couple of months, even against the New Zealand, uh, how we actually go. Uh, finishing off, awesome to see some BBL stars in the ODI squad. You did mention them, Jake Fraser, McGurk, Will Sutherland, Xavier Bartlett. Uh, they're awesome to see how they're going to go into the, the Australian ODI squad and see who gets picked. Do you think the Aussies have chosen the right squads for the uh, White Bowl series? I feel like you're, you're pretty confident and happy with what they've done here. And anything, anyone else that you would have included in these squads? Well, look, it's so interesting. It's, it's the question, I suppose, it, it ultimately the question is what are you trying to achieve from these games? I mean, before yeah. you sort of say, and, and where does that fit in with, within your broader goals? Because there are three formats. There's so many considerations these days. Players are at different stages of the schedule. Some guys play one format, two, three you know, two of the three, different exactly. two of the three. So there's so many different considerations here. Um, and I, I asked McDonald about this um, after after the test, say, for instance, with Steve Smith, who's captain of the side. What yeah. is the point of Steve Smith playing this series? Now, other than I'm sure, you know, it probably helps with ratings and, 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 and you know, having a player like Steve, of Steve Smith's calibre and having Absolutely. some experience with the side is important. But, you know, you've got, a, you've got a champion's trophy 12 months away, which is an important tournament, but, you know, realistically, that is a year away still. And I don't know how much of a – how much – you know, how important it is for Steve Smith to be performing now ahead of the second most important ODI tournament in 12 months' time. Yeah. Um, look, I think they've done, put it this way. I think they've certainly done, certainly done the right thing by resting the quicks in the circumstances. I mean, that makes, would mean no, you know, you just don't need Pat Cummins. Which not necessary, yeah. These games, and, and similar Mitch Marsh, given the all-round demands on him and given he's now the, the T20 captain effectively. Um, Look, I think of the others, um, I think, you know, Inglis, I think, makes a lot of sense, clearly. You know, it's you now his spot with the gloves to... Great for him, yeah. um, Matt Short looks like a rising player across possibly all three formats, but certainly in the white ball formats and was very close to making that World Cup squad. Um, 
Wouldn't have minded seeing Tanvi Sanger have a go on home soil um, in, in, as a spinner, although it's tough with, with Adam Zampa there as well. You, are you ever going to play two spinners in a white ball match in Australia? Are you better off Tanvi going back and playing some red ball cricket? Um, and in terms of the, you know, hard to say, and in terms of the quicks, look, I'm glad. I think Fraser McGurk's fantastic to have a look at him. Um, awesome, yeah. I think that, that makes a lot of sense, especially with, with no Maxwell. He's, he's, you know, mini Maxwell in many respects, um, right down to sort of his... Um, is somewhat uh, loose attitudes toward, toward yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and some of the abandon that he plays with. Um, he's been mentored by Maxwell, and then the quicks. Um, look, Bartlett was interesting. I, mean, I had a really good big bash. I mean, I a bit surprised that Spencer Johnson didn't get a look in. And, and to be fair, yeah. that was named just before the BBL final, and then Johnson really kicked on in the finals. So, um, you yeah, maybe a touch unlucky. Um, and he's they had a look at him, and, and maybe they're better off with Spencer Johnson, him getting some shield cricket. This is, yeah, the, I mean, with some of these guys that are multi players, it's just it's just so hard. But no, look, I really look, I think it's great to see Sutherland get a go because I think he's a, he's a rising star and it's gonna be tough for him with so many all rounders around. Yeah, um, I think it's you know, Cameron Green, um, I'd, you'd argue he'd be better off with a bit of shield cricket, but still good to see him get a, get some more. Proper international cricket under his belt, particularly ODI, where he hasn't played that much um, and, and was in and out of the side during the World Cup. Um, but I like uh, Lance Morris, I think it's great to get him a taste of international cricket. So, and then Hardy is, um, is, a, is a you know really exciting player as well. So, look, I haven't really answered that question particularly well, but there are a lot of different. I think, yeah, no, I think there, there are a lot of considerations, and yeah. um, it's not. It's not straightforward, and, and it just that's that's the nature of the landscape. And then you've got other guys like Marcus Stoinis, who's probably you know off the ODI radar now, but he's gone off to play um, in in another country. So um, you know he's playing in South Africa. So it's going to be going to be really interesting to see uh, where where it all heads from here. Yeah, spot on, Dan. I, I love that reference to our mini Maxi. I'm as a Renegades fan, I'm up and about with Will Sutherland, but definitely Jake Fraser McGurk. The way he plays his cricket, very positive, and just yeah, mini Maxi is a great call. I'm very excited to see how he goes, and it'll be yeah interesting to see who gets picked in those uh, ODI squads or the white ball squads in the coming months. Uh, I think that's it. So check Daniel Cherney out on Code Sports. Some great articles at the moment, all over Twitter. Some yeah, great posts and good fun on there. And thank you very much for coming on, Dan. No, thanks, Liam. Looking forward to next time. Now let's get right back into the usual Cricket Today show. All right, back to the usual show with the usual knuckleheads, uh, Marcus and Leo and the stats guy. Let's have a look at our favourite ODI moment. So Australia play the West Indies on Friday, 2.30 at the MCG. I'm very excited to head down to that one uh, after work. Yeah, so that should be a good, good fun match, especially the way the West Indies held up in the test matches. Uh, I think a lot of people had them... Uh, being really competitive in the ODIs more than the test matches. So the fact that they did really well in the test matches uh, should yeah, make it a really good series here. Uh, let's have a look at yeah some of your favourite moments of all time. Uh, Leo, do you want to start us off? You stole my one. I love this guy uh, in ODIs. And I know he fell off the uh, face of the earth a little bit, but he had a really good short stint for Australia. Yeah, tough luck, uh, stats guy. Get in fast the next time. <laughs> James Faulkner, the finisher against England in 2014. I think this innings right here made me fall in love with cricket, to be honest. Uh, so we were nine for 244, I want to say. Uh, Clint Mackay strolls out to the wicket and everyone <laughs> goes, oh, we might pack up here, go home. <laughs> catch, the, uh, catch the early train home because this game is done. And then Faulkner just absolutely turned it on its head with some massive slogs over cow corner, mid-wicket, square leg, whatever you like to call it. <laughs> Absolute fine hitting against the Poms too. Could not be better. Ben Stokes was getting smacked. You love to see it. <laughs> it was an absolute, just it was an amazing day for Australian cricket. Got us home in the final over. I think he made... Oh, I can't even. I, it's one of those. I don't even know what he made. It's just yeah. great innings. He got, the, got us over the line. Yeah, I, I remember the the graphic came up. He was on fifty off how many, however many balls, and he didn't hit one band, one four. It was all sixes. <laughs> um, that's all I really remember. I don't I actually don't remember what he made, but it was, was just it? yeah. Well, we had fantastic innings. We had Tim Bresman bowl in the final over. It did like England, and um, oh yeah, yeah. Look, they needed. Well, we needed twelve of the final over, and he oh. hit him for three fours in the first three balls of that final over to win the game. He yeah. made Incredible. he made sixty nine of forty seven balls. Uh, that included five sixes, as you said, Leo. Lots of sixes. One hundred forty six strike rate. Uh, yeah, what did it, what did Clint McKay two two not out? Clint McKay he held he held his own. Uh, kept in there. <laughs> A few others, uh, who else? Glenn Maxwell made 50. Marsh made 50. This is a really good match, actually. Then you got, uh, yeah, the some of the bowlers got smacked around for, uh, Ben Stokes got smacked around, 7.4 economy rate. You love to see that. 
and the Aussies got the job. Uh, yeah, that is one of the best moments. It's a finisher. There was a solid uh, couple of months where any time we have a bit of a collapse, the Aussies, you're like, oh, James Faulkner's coming. It's all good. The finisher, he'll finish it off for us. So that, yeah. no, he, he, he did it on more than one occasion as well. Yeah. yeah. He did yeah. it at least three or four times, I reckon. Is, which... is, he, is he Australia's most clutch ODI player? Or I think Bevan, as you mentioned before the show, which you might, he had a few. He was the original finisher in mm. in the uh, the coloured white white ball cricket. Uh, but he's up there. It's funny because he, you wouldn't say he's up there for the best players, but clutch. He, in our lifetime, I'd say he's the most clutch at least. Yeah, no, pretty good. Uh, all right, who have you got, Marcus? You got a, you got another Aussie. Yeah, well, I've got an, an honorable, honorable mention. Uh, yep. You just mentioned him, Michael Bevan. Yeah. Um, I wasn't even alive for this, uh, <laughs> but it was 95, 96, I'm pretty sure. Uh, Australia versus the West Indies, like the upcoming series. And we needed a four off the last ball to win. And Michael Bevan um, hits it straight down the ground, just almost clipped the umpire's head, actually. And then uh, hits it for winning runs. Um, I still remember the commentary in my head uh, like, that's it, that's four. <laughs> and then they, they, we win the game. But uh, my favourite moment just has to be Glenn Maxwell in the recent ODI World Cup, doesn't it? Um, yeah. Against Afghanistan on one leg, hobbling around. Um, we're talking about clutch players and, and finishes. Glenn Maxwell hitting 201 against Afghanistan. I remember when Winvis had us, what, 1%? I think so, yeah. yeah. Uh, at some point. Not that um, win, Viz. <laughs> I reckon Marcus Biz would have had it a little bit higher with uh, Clem Maxwell in. But um, no, that was it. That was one of the best ODI innings, and arguably the best ODI innings of all time. So I think it just has to be that. Yeah, no, nah, it, it definitely was. I, I still can't believe that even happened. It feels like it feels like just the other day, actually. But that, that I can remember that whole innings, the highlights of that were unbelievable. Maxi just looking like he's about to fall over every shot. The, the power in his wrists and his arm and his forearms, he obviously got injured after mm. that because all of his power was coming from, like sort of like golf. He's a guy at golf as well. And it, that that was just unbelievable. You've obviously got Bevan. I'm glad we chucked uh, Bevan in there. Four off the last ball. Got 78 off 88 balls and steered uh, Australia home against the West Indies. So, yeah, really like those ones. I'm going to talk about, stay, stay away from the Aussies. My favorite innings mm. of all time. My favorite innings of all time that is not an Australian. Uh, Leo loves this one as well. Chucked it up on the socials not that long ago. South Africa versus the West Indies. In comes A.B. de Villiers. He scores the fastest ever 100 in ODI cricket. It still is, off 31 balls. It was a pretty small ground, but don't worry about that. I just remember this classic pink top. I love this uh, the pink top that the South Africans were wearing, really different to anything else they've ever worn. Uh, and A.B. just made this this pink top memorable. He's just, everyone was buying. I remember a lot of people, even Australian supporters were loving this top. He was pulling out shots from all angles. He, he's probably one of the original guys that could play 360s around, 360 degrees around the ground with ramp shots. He was playing down the ground, reverse sweeps. He was unbelievable. Had 149 of 44 balls. And I think that's, I think that other than maybe Maxi is the best ever ODI uh, innings off. Oh, it was against yeah, West Indies were bowling okay. They they had uh, towards the end though they had the guys that were getting absolutely smashed. The top three, which makes this sound a little bit worse for South Africa, made over 128 each. So they were getting absolutely wow. smacked. But AB said, "No, nah, I'm going to make it off a lot less balls than you guys. Uh, 149 or 44 in those classic pink tops. I think yeah, has to be my favourite member. Do you guys remember watching that one at all? Oh yeah, yeah. That was that was a great innings, wasn't it? Just like seeing nuts. him play those shots around the ground. Um, yeah, you're just thinking, when's this? When's he going to miss hit one? And he yeah, he never, he never did. Um, that was crazy. Yeah, I, I couldn't believe that one. I, I might have to get one of those South Africa pink tops. Actually, I, I, I keep saying that, uh, poking up that top. I'll see if they're around. I'll have to wear it on the next live show or one of our next shows. My copy bit of grief. Not the best color going around, but they look, they look pretty cool. Uh, all right, I think we've got through our favorite ODI moments. Uh, big thanks to Dan Journey for today's show. That was a really fun interview. He, I learned a lot, actually. He taught me a lot of things about uh, the Test Championship and things like that and the Test Championship table. Uh, so that's it from us. Uh, another Cricket Today show. Get right around the show. Subscribe on your podcast apps, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, etc. Like and review it, would you? Chuck a follow to Cricket Today and Cricket Today AU all over the socials. That's Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and X. Chuck a follow to Daniel Cherney on Twitter. He does, chucks up a lot of good posts there and his articles from Code Sports. Also, chuck a follow to Football Today and Football Today AU. We've got a big uh, EPL midweek uh, wrap. Oh, sorry, midweek preview, actually, show that's gone up this week. We're going to do another weekend preview as well, which will be very exciting. Uh, send in any questions via the socials, anything you want us to chat to us about. Uh, that's it, I think, guys. And we're done for another episode. Thank you, Marcus. Thanks, Sasko. I reckon you look cute in pink. 
Oh, thank. That's, uh, I'll take. I'll take that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leo. <laughs> Thanks, that's guy. I disagree with Marcus. I think you'd look terrible in pink. Oh, thank you. That's all right. I'll. I'll I'm happy to be on somewhere in between there. I'll just have to practice my shots like AB and uh, see how I go from there. And thank you very much to Jared for producing. Thanks to AB Devils for producing that awesome uh, effort in the pink top. That's another episode of Cricket Today done. We're out. <laughs>